In this tutorial, we're going to be looking at how we can use motion vector passes rendered in mental ray from Maya to add post motion blur in Maya composite to, uh, to our scene. And really what I want to do is try to highlight a few of the workflow issues that come up when working with multiple render layers. So in my environment here, I've got some objects that are just attached to motion paths sort of flying around here. We want to render these out as multi-channel EXR files and add a motion vector pass to them. So the first thing we need to do is create a multi-channel EXR file, change the image file format to EXR from IFF, and also go to your quality setting, jump down to the frame buffer, and tell that frame buffer that you want to calculate out a 32-bit float image, and that's for the motion vector file. So with that done, and we go ahead and we render this off, you'll see that the scene's basically set up using the Sun Sky system inside of Maya. So the Sun Sky gives us this nice synthetically generated environment, and it puts a tone mapper on the camera that's applied as a lens shader. So that's good for some things and bad for others, and we'll, we'll sort of address that as we work through this presentation. So what we want to do is we want to blur these arrows movement in post, so we need to isolate them from the background, and we're going to use the layer system inside of Maya to do that. So I'm going to create a layer that's going to be my sky layer, and I'm also going to create a second layer that we're going to use as a utility pass to generate a bunch of custom map files. So our first layer we'll just call sky. Obviously there's nothing associated with that layer. Our second layer we're going to call disco. And this disco layer, we want to associate actually our three arrows as well as our ground plane. And what we want to do is we want to add a shader override to these objects in the form of a surface shader that's got primary color associated with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a red, a green, a blue arrow as well as a black background that has the alpha channel in it. So essentially in one image file, we will end up with four different matte files. So if we zero out our matte opacity for that guy and jump over to our hypershade, we'll just graph that, that dude and duplicate it a few times here. So with that done, we can just sort of uh, create our primary colors here as well as make our alpha channel. So we'll get green and red and we'll put the black to this guy. So if we jump back to our master layer, the original shaders, our sky is going to be obviously just our isolated sky. And then now our disco pass is going to be um, these new shaders that we assigned specific to that layer. But there's going to be a couple problems with it. Problem number one is the sky is still in the background. So if we were to pull a mat using the blue, the green, or the red, there's going to be a little bit of the blue sky anti-alias into those edges and it won't give us a clean edge. So we need to get rid of that blue sky in the background, and it's also still got that tone mapper on there. So these aren't 100% red, 100% green, or 100% blue. So we need to deal with that. And we're going to use um, the render settings to do that. So we bring up the render settings. What we want to do is we want to get rid of that lens shader only on the disco layer. So we're going to use something called a layer override to do that. And basically what a layer override is, is it allows you to have a tweak made specific to that render layer for any attribute in Maya, and you just right mouse click on the attribute to create it. So when I say create layer override, it changes colors and it's giving me a visual cue that this layer may be different than the other layers in my scene. And if I turn off the lens shader, you can see that basically for my sky layer, the lens shader is still on. For my master layer, the lens shader is still on. But for my disco layer, that lens shader has now been turned off because it was a render layer override. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and fix the physical sun sky so that it doesn't generate its background. Um, and there's a, This is a pretty cool little trick. It's basically if you just turn on use background but don't pipe anything into that, that physical sun sky will render as black in the background, but it would still show up in secondary rays like reflections and final gather and things like this. So this is just for the, for the background image essentially. So now if we render this out, what do we get? Well, we get exactly what we want. We've got primary colors, red, green, and blue, that are isolating our objects for us. And this is the most simple example of, of using this, but obviously you can imagine the complexities that you can get by doing these shader assignments to isolate certain parts of pieces of geometry from other pieces of geometry. It's a really powerful feature, workflow more than a feature. And then obviously in our alpha channel, we've got just the ground there. So we're going to save this for, uh, for reference sake. We're rendering out frame, it looks like frame 13, which we'll use for the rest of the demo here. So now that we've done that, if we jump back to our sky layer and render this, well, what's going to happen is it's going to render black, right? Because we turned off 
the, the primary, uh, the background image by, by throwing that switch on. So again, we want to make a render layer override for our sky layer so that it comes back. So pretty, pretty straightforward there. So if we jump over to our master layer and we render this guy out, what we're going to end up with now is exactly what we want. We've got our arrows and our foreground elements isolated from the sky. We've got nice black um, anti-aliasing edges happening here so we can tell the compositor to pre-multiply those edges with black as opposed to some random blue color that the sky would have introduced so we won't get any weird edge halo effects or things like that later down in post. So now what we want to do is talk about motion blur and motion vectors inside of Maya. So the way the motion vector pass works in Maya is very similar to motion blur. It basically needs to look at um, a couple of frames and the camera snapshots in between those two frames to figure out to, to generate the image with the blur in it. So it needs to evaluate two frames and somewhere in between those two frames, take the picture, take the snapshot, and that the time at which in between those two frames that that snapshot happens is based on the shutter angle. And I think that Maya ships with a shutter angle sort of not in a very convenient place to work with. So we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. So let's jump into our render settings go to our passes. So this is where we can start to, to generate a whole variety of render passes, right? For this example, all we really want to worry about is 2D motion vectors. So we're going to go ahead and create that. So now I have a list of all the passes available in my scene. You know what? We'll create a couple more. We'll create just a, a beauty. We're not going to apply this to anything, but I just wanted to create it so you could see that these are all the lists of, of different passes that we could associate to our, to our render layers. So for our master pass here, we want to go ahead and make an association to that motion vector pass, right? So when we render out our master layer, we're going to get the primary buffer that calculated, basically the, the main render that we just saw, as well as the secondary buffer that's extracted in render time of that motion vector pass. If we jump over to our sky layer, you can see that we haven't associated any passes with it. Same with the disco layer. So setting up the passes is very easy inside of Maya. So I mentioned that the motion vector pass works very similarly to motion blur. It needs to evaluate two frames. And watch what happens when I hit my render button on my master pass now that we've put this 2D motion vector pass into our association field. Look at the number down here. Watch 13. When I hit render, 13 jumps to 12.8. So it basically is taking frame 12 and frame 13 and using the difference, you know, the movement between 12 and 13 to calculate the vector in which this is moving and the camera takes a snapshot somewhere along the line there based on that shutter angle. And the problem with that is it doesn't line up now, right? Because we just we just rendered 12.8 as opposed to 13 that we rendered back here. So this is where changing a couple of the default values that Maya ships with on the camera makes working with vector passes so much easier. So what we want to do is we want to change that shutter angle. Instead of being 144, if you put this to 360, it basically makes that snapshot where the camera takes a picture be on a 0.5 value. So it makes it very easy for us to offset that so that we get the proper render. So it used to happen at 12.8. We make the shutter angle 360. So now what happens is it's going to happen, it's going to again go backwards in time, but instead of being at a random value of you know 12.8, it's going to be at um, 12.5, which you saw it just hop back there. So we still have that offset that we need to deal with, but by putting the angle to 360, it just makes it so much easier to deal with that offset because all we have to do now is just push this guy forward half a frame. Now if we render it 13.5, it's going to look backwards in time. It's going to take that snapshot directly halfway between the, the, frame that it, the two frames that it's looking at, so it's going to basically put us back to frame 13 for all practical purposes. So now that we've pushed our frame rate up to 13.5, we render that with motion blur. It's actually really rendering frame 13. It'll look exactly the same as our disco pass. So all you need to know is when you're dealing with motion vectors inside of Maya, change your sh shutter angle on your camera to 360, and any render layers that you have that have that motion vector pass associated with them, you need to nudge that frame forward by half a frame. And you would do that with a render layer override, right? Like if I was rendering a sequence of images, I'd jump into my common tab, I'd jump over here, you know, I'd say render a sequence, and I'd say create render layer over, oops, and create a render layer override for that frame range and put that to 13.5 or, or 1.5 in this example to render from, from 1 to 10. So that's really all you need to all you need to remember. 
So now that we've got these renders done, let's jump into Maya Composite and start talking about how we can put those together using a few nodes to, to blur this in post. So Maya Composite, um, I've already got an, a scene set up here that's got the, the size properly set. So we'll just import in some images. Now, I'm not gonna be giving a full Maya Composite demo here. I'm assuming you know how to use Composite. So we're just gonna import in an image. And I will point out a few tricks I have a bookmark set for my images and in that temp directory is all those test renders that we just did. So we'll grab that master layer, motion blur. Remember it's, um, it's a multi-channel EXR, so it's really big. It's got, it's got that full 32-bit EXR file as well as that vector file in there. So we get our primary buffer and then our secondary buffer, which would be that motion vector pass is calculated out also. So in that one image, we're carrying two channels. So here's a pretty cool trick inside of Maya Composite. If you hold down your C key and you click down and drag, um, you know, basically keep the C key pressed down and click with the left mouse button or the pen down and drag, and drag off a node, it just does a simple little duplicate. So we've got this guy duplicated out. Obviously we need our primary buffer as well as our secondary buffer or our motion vector pass for us. So we've got our two images here. And if you remember, we also rendered out a disco pass and a sky pass. So I'm just going to quickly duplicate that two more times and then just jump to my file browse here and just go sky, grab our sky, and then go in here and grab our disco. Oops, I didn't grab it. Let's disco you. Okay, so we get our disco pass. We get our sky pass, which we're not seeing anything because this guy is set up to have an alpha channel and that sky pass didn't have an alpha channel. So we've got our arrows and our sky that we want to layer on top of each other. So we're just going to do a really simple blend comp on that. So if we take that guy and put it on top of that guy, that's our, that's our arrows. Notice the black edge here, right? This is what we talked about is those edges getting pre-multiplied with a random color. Well, because we put them on black, it's really easy to say unpre-multiply. And as soon as I click that unpre-multiply, you can see that it sucked all that black out. So really, really useful. And then we'll just feed that to our comp. So on top of my, uh, my player here, at any given time, I can use hotkeys to jump, you know, do I want to see my current active, my input, my output. If I click seven, it shows me my comp out. And the reason I clicked seven is because I want to start to introduce in a blur node to start to motion blur um, these, these, these guys using that vector pass, but I want to see it in the context of the final composite layered on top of the sky. So if we jump over to our filtering and we grab the blur node, and we just drop that blur node on that little line there, it introduces it into the mix here. So it's sort of flowing through there. And if we put this to the forward vectors and we start to go to the vector tab and increase the length of that, it starts to blur that out, right? The problem is that it's not blurring it past the edge of the object. So there's a really cool little trick that you can do. If you supply this motion vector file with an alpha channel and then pipe it into the blur node, it can actually extend the vectors past the edge of the object. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just use a simple alpha tool to add an alpha onto that object. So if we go to, oops, alpha is gonna be at the top of the list here. And we go to the set alpha and we drop that in the chain there. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, you know what, this doesn't have an alpha channel. We wanna set the alpha channel from this object's alpha. So now we've got the alpha channel sort of we hit our six key, you can see it kind of coming through here. So this is our motion blur file, our motion vector file. This is it with the set alpha added into it. It's now getting pumped into that blur node. And if we hit seven, we'll go back to our final comp output. So now with that blur node active, we can start to increase the radius of that offset there. And this is a little bit high, so we'll put that to 0.05 there. But you can see that we start to get this really nice kind of motion blur effect happening on, on those guys because of that set alpha. So the last thing that we may, we may want to do is we may want to introduce into this maybe some, some color correction or a color tweak. And we've got this, um, this other file over here that's basically got the RGB values. So if we were to go to the options and only show the RGB values for that, you can see that we've got um, you know, red, green, and blue as well as the alpha for the, uh, for the ground plane there. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this to feed in a custom mask to a color correct node. So we'll just grab something like Photo Lab and we'll, we'll drop that in the mix there. So before it gets, we'll hit seven on top of the player to view our comp out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, you know what, this Photo Lab is going to adjust, we'll just, we'll just you know, push it to a color. 
or right here, we'll do it with the exposure because it's pretty drastic there. So we did a pretty drastic color correction on all of these images right here, on the foreground images. But really what we want to do is we want to have that isolated based on either the red, green, or blue of our mask file here. So if you go to masking, right now it's isolated on the alpha channel, but it could be the red channel or the green channel or the blue channel. So it's really just a simple little trick using that disco mat to isolate where that color correction is happening. So that's a quick overview of how to hook up the motion vector pass inside of Maya Composite using the trick of setting the alpha channel so that we can do that edge extend so it gives us that nice edge extend and using the disco mat to isolate where we're doing our photo lab based color correction to only one of those arrows. And um, hopefully that makes sense to you guys and you find some value in it. Thanks for, thanks for watching.